So hopefully you're all as excited as I am. Um, of course, we are very, very lucky to have Kelsey Hightower as our closing keynote. Um, as you know, he's very famous for demos. So we um, are excited to see what he'll be playing around with. Um, we had sort of a, a chat about what he'd be getting excited about and um, what he thought he, he would have about Git in general, about the term Git ops, um, and you know what the developer experience might be. So he loves to uh, explain that and show that uh, through a demo. So. I think what we're doing today is, uh, so he'll be doing a demo first, and then once he's come down, uh, Cornelia will join and I'll moderate all your questions to do a little bit of a conversation. So please, uh, if you join the Slack channel, uh, post your questions there and we'll get to as many as possible. So Kelsey, are you ready? Yeah, I'm unmuted now, there you go. Yes, you're unmuted. So now you're on the live stage at GitOps Days. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, of course, we know that you are at Google and you've been there for a while. You've been such a great face in the Kubernetes community. So we really appreciate um, your thoughts here and we'll go into them, I guess, after the demo. Is that how you wanna kick off? Yeah, so my goal really is to, if there's a lot of people probably watching that are like me, I'm fairly new to this concept like GitOps. Maybe not necessarily using Git to get things done or even the style of automation behind GitOps. So what I want to do today is share kind of how I reason about learning these things. So I'll start with a little bit of hands-on, show some prototypes that I've been working on, and then get into the fundamentals and then hopefully have a great conversation to dive in more into the details. Excellent. I love that. So you want to share I'll start by sharing my screen. How about that? Okay. So I can yes. take over. And you can All right. take I'm over. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll give it one second because I know we were practicing and you're using a Chromebook. So one, uh, you'll have to turn on your camera again because I noticed that that's what happened there. And then once you did that, so we're going to check with Stacy, our producer. Does it look good? Is his is his camera on this? Is his video on the side? Thumbs up from our producer. There you go. Excellent. I'm going to slip away. All right. Thank you so much. All right, and I'll try to slow down a little bit with the transitions between my browser and um, my terminal to show things off. So we're at GitOps days. And again, just want to go into the details of how to think about some of this stuff. So I used to work at a company called Puppet Labs, and I worked on a tool called the Puppet Forge, right? So this is my first experience with this idea of infrastructure as code. And back then, we used to write Puppet code, right? So if you're not familiar with Puppet, it's a configuration management tool where you write these modules and those modules essentially have a declarative API. And then basically what happens is we take that module code and we throw it over to a puppet agent that then attempts to reconcile the server or network device that's being managed. And then we got into a point where we started to share those modules with other people. And a lot of people started to say, hey, this kind of experience is this whole idea of infrastructure as code. The other thing that became super interesting is that we decided that you could actually package up these snippets of Puppet code and the providers underneath them. And that was a really key thing. So it's one thing to describe your automation, but it's another to have a provider that knows how to configure SSH or install a package from a RPM or YUM repository. And then when you package all of those things together, you end up with this module. And those modules can then be pulled from anywhere. And I remember there was a thing where some people used to keep all of their modules in like a GitHub repository. So that way, as you're iterating on your Puppet modules, right, kind of written in this Puppet DSL and their providers, they could all be in one place and you could just bring them down. So the fundamentals are pretty clear, right? Take all of your code and throw it up there. But there's something drastically different about this era of automation it feels less about scripting things, right? So it's not about writing Bash or Ruby or even the Puppet DSL. We're fundamentally changing the way we think about the front end. So less about code, and we're adopting a more of a declarative config. Now, we'll, we'll dive into the details there in a second. But to think that we're going to say no, no front end full programming languages, I'm going to push all the smarts into a reconciler. And we're going to look at the details there. The tool I'll be using, of course, is Flux from the WeWorks team. Uh, if you haven't seen Flux, but the idea here is that 
once you start to have a really nice reconciler, so something that can change the state of the world, and then you have a resource definition, or some people would just say like a config or a YAML file. If you're in the Kubernetes community, these are the things we keep in the YAML file, like a deployment, config map, or a secret. Those things can be checked in, and then we can have a little loop that just watching our Git repository that applies it. But for all of this GitOps stuff to make sense, right? Git is very obvious. Put stuff in version control, something pulls it out and does something with it. But the other part of that equation that I think is super important that most people may not quite understand is you really need smart reconcilers to make all of this flow fairly nicely. So that's what we're gonna dive into. The other misconception that I've seen a lot is GitOps is only for Kubernetes or tools like Flux in this case only work for Kubernetes. And sometimes you'll even see it in the doc where these tools are a perfect fit for Kubernetes. And you start to ask yourself, like, does it work for any kind of other infrastructure? And I think the answer should be yes, but we have to dig into the details there. So let's have an example. First, I don't want to deploy to Kubernetes. I'm actually using a serverless platform called Cloud Run, okay? So the idea with Cloud Run is I'm personally right now not quite interested in managing a bunch of Kubernetes clusters to just run a container. While I still use Kubernetes for a lot of other things, I'm starting to leverage a lot more serverless platforms. But here's the thing. I actually still want that GitOps workflow where I can describe what I want and just have some automation tool keeping the outside world reconciled with that state. So here's where the ops part comes in. Just a quick reminder. So when I was a system administrator, this is the way we used to think about the world. If I have an app that I wanted to deploy, number one, you figure out the command line or the script that you need to write, mainly because you want some form of automation. Now this could be Puppet, Chef, or Ansible for people that are using config management. So for me, I'm using a tool called Cloud Run. So this is gonna be a little bit easier in terms of deployment and I'll make my screen a little bit bigger here in a second. So I have this simple app. Uh, it's basically an app called HTTP bin. It basically just gives me a little web app where I can poke around in my web browser. Nothing fancy here. But when I look at the deployment script, it's pretty straightforward, right? Make a bash script. Here I'm using the gcloud command line tool. I'm just gonna deploy a service called HTTP bin. This part is super critical because everyone thinks that GitOps is just like this radical rethink of everything we've been doing. What you gotta do is rewind it a little bit and just look at the fundamentals. One, if we know what the inputs are to our deployment target, Kubernetes or Cloud Run, this is a bit harder when you're dealing with just a raw Linux server, right? You're SSHing, you're copying things around, you have systemd unit files. The API isn't clear, but I think adding something like Docker to a VM makes this all a little bit more straightforward. So if you look at this, if I were to run this script, what I expect is to have a container deployed to Cloud Run, I can click on it. Again, pay attention because this is the fundamentals. So I'm just gonna run this script really quickly. I know some people are thinking like, wow, this is so basic. It is, but some reason people forget all the basics when they're trying to understand this new stuff. So what I want you to pay attention to is the pragmatism here. Learn how to automate things at the very lowest level, what the inputs are, because those are gonna be really key to describing all the stuff that you're gonna need when you start thinking about GitOps as a whole. So we ran that command and we see that this thing is deployed. Hey, power of serverless. Let's click on it just to make sure it actually works. You know how people do the sleight of hand in the live demos. Let's see if we can make it real. So we'll click on this link and ideally if this is working, we should see our application pop up and just give me the standard HTTP bin front page and it was working. Sweet. So now we're reminded of the ops part of this whole GitOps thing. So what do we need to take advantage of this modern style GitOps? Well, number one, ideally Kubernetes has taught us a lot about declarative config. Maybe we don't need a programming language at the core of it. Of course, it's okay to use tools like Helm and Customize or even Pulumi where you can actually use full programming languages to generate the inputs and we'll see what those look like in a second. All right, so what we'll do now is I'm just gonna delete this. So this is the ops part. You can write all kinds of tools to automate this process. You can even use Terraform to do this. But remember that Git part. 
we need to check in some artifacts to make this be automated. One, I'm using Flux to be able to pull and watch a Git repository. So I have a very simple Git repository here. We'll get into what's in there in a second, but I need a tool that would actually do the heavy lifting. And again, that's where Flux comes in. It's going to be the thing that goes and watches that repository. But what do we put in that repository? One, one way to think about this is maybe I just check in all my scripts, right? I could take this bash script, deploy it to uh, push it to Git, version it, and then check out the script and just run it. But then you look at the script and you're like, well, what happens when it's time to delete? Well, I could write another bash script called delete that does and undoes all of this. Um, I can also do a thing that knows how to handle updates. But by the time you start building out a framework in Bash, you're going to be right back to where we are with like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. There's nothing wrong with those tools, but you start building out all of these scripting and you may not have the reusable components that you want. Like how do you authenticate who gets to run these scripts? None of that lives here clearly. And it's also hard to patch this. If I were to check in the script and I wanted my CI CD system to come here and change the image out, that's not going to be easy to do because I would have to actually parse this and make sure that I preserve the syntax if I go and swap things out. And all my people out there looking at set and awk, like put set and awk down. <laughs> we have a different solution to this. So the first thing we want to do is if you're unaware, Kubernetes has this thing called custom resource definitions. Remember, the operational part of this is we want to deploy things, containers to cloud run. So one thing we can do is model the input. Look at all these flags. These flags are the foundation for a new resource type. Kubernetes has taught us a bunch of things. So one thing that we can do is we can make a custom resource definition. So the nice thing about custom resource definitions is it gives us an ability to leverage Kubernetes as a control plane. This is not about using Kubernetes or running Docker images. It's literally saying, let Kubernetes be our API server for even the tools that we're building so we don't have to build those from scratch. My custom resource is going to be called Cloud Run Services. And I have my own namespace too, gcp.hightowerlabs.com. Okay? And then the next thing you do is you have to define this little schema down here. I know this may be hard to see from some of you all, but the goal is I'm defining a lot of those flags. I'm just starting from my bash script is how I think about this. I have my CPU property. I have concurrency. I have image. I even tell Kubernetes that image is a string. And you can do some other neat stuff down here as well. I can do default values, like for memory setting. I can say if someone omits their memory setting or flag, I can default. And that usually contributes to the usability of your particular tool. And then down here, we can do some interesting things of like how I would like the command line tool. We're all familiar with kubectl, the Kubernetes command line tool. What I'm saying here is like, this is how I want fields to be printed out if I were to go and get these resources. So the thing to remember here is that I can take my command line flags and turn them into a data model for Kubernetes to serve up a RESTful endpoint. Kubernetes won't be doing the heavy lifting per se, but it will give me a place to store these objects. Now, the thing you do with CRDs is you do kubectl apply, and you just say, hey, Kubernetes, I want you now to be aware of this new thing that I made called Cloud Run Services. That doesn't exist in Kubernetes out of the box, but I can submit it to Kubernetes, and it does all the magic to make this available. All right, so what's next? Now we have a data model in place. Now, so instead of running bash scripts, what we can now do is something like this. Look at this. With that CRD in place, that means Kubernetes now understands a new kind. The kind here is cloud run service. I just made that up. And now I can give it a name. We'll call it HTTP bin. And the image that we want is the same one for the flags. If you look at this, I essentially took the flags and converted them to a data model. Nothing, nothing um, revolutionary here, but look at this. There's no scripting. These things can now be patched. There's tools like Customize that work really nicely. I could give this as input and say something like, hey, Customize, I want you to take the spec dot image and add a different image. And then it makes it easy to integrate in any CI CD system. Now we're dealing with data. So I like to use the term infrastructure as data 
because now we operate on a data model that has validations and that has easy way to substitute various tools. You can use Helm, you can use Customize, you can use whatever you want to manipulate this data model before you check it in. Okay, so here's the next step. One thing I can do with that CRD in place, I can say kubectl get cloud run services. If I hit enter now, you'll see there's nothing there. Good. So the next thing we got to do is, since we have the perfect data model, the next thing we want to do here is submit our resource definition. I'm going to show you all again before I push it up. So this will say, I want a Cloud Run instance with these parameters, just like I did with the bash script. We'll say kubectl apply. Now, keep in mind here, all we did at this point was tell Kubernetes that this thing should exist. Now, if you're scratching your head at this point, like, okay, now what? Kubernetes doesn't know anything about Cloud Run, neither does Flux, and we're not quite there at the Flux part yet. All we do now is have a data model, and I submitted the data by hand. You'll notice I didn't check it in, it's not version controlled, and it's just here on my laptop. If I go over here to Cloud Run, you'll also see there's nothing running. And this is that missing link. We have a data model on the front end. Flux solves the problem if I were to check in that data format in YAML and applies it to the cluster telling Kubernetes it should exist, but who actually does the work? And that's where the reconciliation comes in. I'll share this code on GitHub, but basically what I did was I wrote a simple implementation of a controller. There are great projects out there to help you write production ready Kubernetes controllers. I just did something quick and dirty for this talk. I don't think you should replicate it in production. I'm pretty sure if I put it on GitHub, somebody's gonna run it in production tomorrow. Don't do that, but I'm pretty sure you will. Now, I'll show you a little bit of how the high level code works. Don't worry about how it works in detail. You can walk through that on your own time. But at a very high level, I just start my app and then I have what I call a reconciliation loop. So what I'm doing here is saying in the background, every 10 seconds, I want to get all of the Cloud Run services, meaning go to Kubernetes and say, Kubernetes, give me all of the Kuber Kubes, uh, Cloud Run services that you know about. It's basically the equivalent of running this command. And to be honest, what I'm doing in the background, just for this quick and dirty thing, I'm actually just saying, I'm running this command in my Go code, and I'm just spitting it out as YAML or JSON and just using this output inside of my actual code. So I'm literally taking the command line equivalent and use it in my controller. This is a good way to develop. So once I get all the Cloud Run services, I basically process them by iterating through them in a list. Now remember, I have a bit of responsibility in this controller. I'm responsible for paying attention to when the custom resources are created and when those custom resources are deleted. Right? That's the responsibility of my control loop over here. And look at the logic. It's pretty straightforward. Get all the services and then process them. Now, there's a bunch of details that I'm not showing you here in another source code file, but this is the high-level way to think about this. This is a reconciliation loop. Now, I'm going to run that reconciliation loop right here on my laptop. This is another misconception. Lots of people believe that these controllers actually need to run in Kubernetes. They don't. All they need to be able to do is actually get data from Kubernetes and then modify that data if they have some status updates, like the URL for that particular Cloud Run instance when I choose to run it. So when I build controllers these days, I tend to run them either from my laptop or I'll run them in some serverless platform like Cloud Functions or Cloud Run. So we're just going to run this on my local laptop. Now. The way this works, I'm using kubectl inside of my controller, so I'm authenticating using my kube config, so it tends to just work. So now we're going to start the controller. Now, remember, this is that key part to making all of this GitOps stuff work. You have a data model on the front end, we version control it on the back end, and something like Flux sucks it in and applies it to Kubernetes, but this is where all of the heavy lifting happens. So I'm going to run that controller. You'll see that it's starting. 
And what I'm doing is I'm waiting 10 seconds, and then I'm going to call out to the Kubernetes API and fetch all of those custom resources. And now I'm processing them. And you notice this statement here, updating HTTP bin cloud run service. Let's go check out what's happening behind the scenes. If I hit refresh here, you can see that this thing is now spinning up just as if I would have ran it on the command line. So with a controller like this, I can either install it in the Kubernetes cluster or host it somewhere else. But just know this is the thing that's responsible for looking at those custom objects. Now, if I click on this, you'll see that this is the same thing that I was doing earlier with the command line. So let's click on this just to make sure it's all working. And as this comes up, we'll see that everything is working fine here, right? So now we have HTTP bin showing nicely in our browser. And now we can go and start to complete the whole end-to-end -end solution here. Now remember what your reconciler is responsible for. You also need to make sure that if something's already in sync, meaning if the user's desired state defining the YAML file matches, you have to make sure that you don't keep updating the service unnecessarily. So what I'm doing here is I'm fetching data from the hosted Cloud Run API and comparing the results with the desired state. And if there's nothing to do, I just skip it. Now, here's the other thing. What happens if you delete the resource? So if I say kubectl get resources, I can also delete them. So if I delete it, and we'll delete the thing called HTTP bin, your controller's responsibility is to detect that that happened and now you need to delete it upstream because there is no declaration that says it needs to be around. GitOps only works when these controllers are handling the full life cycle of these resources. So now if I go back to Cloud Run, we'll see that it's gone. So we get now the data model is the fundamental piece for this GitOps workflow. We understand how operations gets encapsulated in many ways encoded into these control loops. Now let's complete the puzzle. We'll keep our controller running just because, and now what we'll do is we'll take a different approach. Now, instead of me creating these things manually, we'll see that there's nothing in here now. I have Flux already installed, so kubectl get pods dash n Flux. And you'll see that we have a Flux controller. That's the thing that's been told to watch a specific Git repository. And then it's storing some state inside of memcache, but we won't be touching container images that need to be patched. We're basically using this as a proxy to control Cloud Run. Now, this may seem foreign to some people, but this is how a lot of the cloud load balances works as well. Most of those controllers are just proxies for something that runs outside of the cluster. This isn't that different. All right, last thing here is we need to host this config somewhere. So instead of doing this manually, now we're about to go all in on this GitOps idea. No more hitting Kubernetes directly. We're going to adopt the workflow that most people find in source code development using something like Git. GitHub is my favorite kind of Git hosting site. So I have a very simple Git repo here. And again, Flux has access to this repository. And underneath here, you'll see a couple of things. One is, there's nothing but a readme and there is no configs in here. So the next thing we can do is we can fix that. So what I'll do is I'll copy that same config we were using earlier. And then I'm just gonna put it in this cloud run services. Now ahead of time, I've already told Flux that it should look for Kubernetes configurations inside of these two directories. Now inside of this directory, we can do a git status and you'll see that there's a new file here. So if we say kubectl apply, not apply, we don't wanna do that. We wanna check it in. So we'll say git add, git status to make sure that's the only file. And then we'll just do a commit message. Add HTTP bin cloud run service. And now we just push it. Now, ideally, your team may have a different workflow. Ideally, you might want to do a pull request for someone to review and then have it merged. But ideally, once it's merged into master or whatever branch you're telling Flux to look at, it's going to take action.
And remember, Flux isn't going to do the heavy lifting. Flux's only job is to pull from version control and apply it just like we did on the command line to Kubernetes. So git push origin master. And once we push that, we can look at our upstream repository. And what I'm also going to do is throw a watch over here. So we'll say QCTL git cloud res services. And we won't see anything there. So now what we're waiting on is for Flux to detect that there's a change upstream. And let's go and look at our repository now. You'll see we just did this commit, add HTTP pin service. We come over here and we see the YAML file in play. So now we have everything inside of Git. This becomes our workflow. Any changes we want to the infrastructure, we go through the repository. Now, the, no, the dope thing about this is if you install Flux in, let's say, 100 servers, now you have all 100 of those clusters looking at the same repository. Flux has some really advanced features in terms of like rolling things out in progressive style or some canary type patterns. I'm just using something simple here, like make this config run everywhere. And if we come back to our window, we can see about 40 seconds ago, Flux picked up that change inside of version control. If I go back to Cloud Run, we'll hit refresh here. And now the service is running again. So if you look at all of the steps here, it's like, hey, you probably know all the fundamentals. Make sure you know what the inputs are to your deployment target. It helps if you write a bash script first to help you really conceptualize what the inputs need to be. And then what you have the opportunity to do is to define your own data model in that Kubernetes resource definition. If you want to think about this, you get a REST server for free. All you have to do is define the data model. And now people can actually use a GitOps workflow because if your controller is smart and it knows how to add and remove and reconcile things, then everyone else in your organization can actually use a GitOps workflow to manage just about anything, even things that don't run inside of Kubernetes. I hope that was helpful. That's the end of my live demo. And maybe we'll jump into a discussion to dig into the details. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think Stacy, my one, <laughs> three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate that. And it's been exciting to see what's going on in the Slack channel with all the comments and questions that hopefully bring in more of those. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Cornelia and I'll be here monitoring. So just holler to me. Super, thank you, Tamo. And thank you, Kelsey, for that fantastic demo. Um, I, I am sure that, and I know that you had other events today. Um, I know you're speaking at other events. So again, thank you for making time for us. So you probably haven't been able to, to tune in for a lot of our, uh, our talks over the last couple of days, but um, those people who have been with us just saw you actually touch and program every one of the four elements that we talk about being critical to GitOps. You check things into Git, you had a declarative configuration, you had something which was reconciling that over into some run, you know, some environment, um, which was Kubernetes. Kubernetes was the place that you were storing those things, even though you're not deploying to it, and some reconciler at the end. So awesome. Thank you for, I, I think everybody, you, you just made it real for every single person. Um, so the first thing that I have though is that, so does that mean that I need to build reconcilers to do GitOps? Uh, for the most part, I would say yes. Um, the, the good news is there's lots of uh, reconcilers. The truth is, let me back up for a second. I think there's still a lot of value if you have no reconcilers today. If you just get into the habit of saying, we want to review what people are doing as a company culture. That's a teaching opportunity for everyone on the team. It helps people learn the actual automation tool and what goes in and out of it. It also helps you roll back in case it doesn't work. I'm pretty sure a lot of people know what life is like when it doesn't work. So I think just having that cultural idea that we should checkpoint, share, collaborate should be the foundation of all operational workflows. But if you really want what we just talked about, where you people can get this kind of um, assumption that if I define something in a very lightweight data model and it feels like everything just happens automatically, I don't know if you can pull that off without that reconciler or you'll just be doing things manually, right? You'll be checking these out, calling kubectl applied by hand and 
touching this stuff over here. So I think that reconciliation loop is critical to this working. Yeah. Now, some of those reconciliation loops are baked in or might have been installed by somebody if, if your target is Kubernetes. Um, so if you're, for example, deploying applications, the reconcilers are there. The deployment reconciler, the services, the replica set. So some of those reconcilers are already available to you. And we've been talking a little bit about cluster API being a reconciler that is available for cluster, cluster management as well. So that's, a, that's exactly right. So the, the reconcilers most people are familiar with are a deployment. That thing reconciles the containers running on the Docker, the ingress controller, whatever cloud provider you pick, or if you're using something like Envoy or Nginx inside of your cluster, there's a reconciler making sure that that configs uh, the Nginx or load balancer config matches your Kubernetes definition. So I think we're all used to those reconcilers. And I guess to your point, they set the bar pretty high for people building their own reconcilers because they hope you are managing the entire life cycle. Yep. Um, one of the things that I, I, one of the ways that I express this whole notion of reconciliation is that the way that we used to program in the scripts that you talked about was that we had this, this misconception that we could reach a state of doneness. So, oh, once I've run the script, I'm done. But we know that in the cloud, we're never done because there's always something that's changing, whether it's an infrastructure change or it's a change that you made to a, a commit that you then just did in, in Git. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the job is to try to constrain the imperative nature of what we're doing. Everything I just showed you is fairly imperative to be truthful. But what we want to do is we want to encapsulate all that imperative workflow inside of that control loop. So I think when most people think about running scripts, they copy a script to a server or they use SSH or some other tool, and they hope that that script runs perfectly. And if it doesn't, maybe they add a few more if statements and checks over time. But we know what we all do. You just log into the server and you start fixing stuff by hand and hope it doesn't happen the next time. Yeah, you actually touched upon something that we'll geek out a little bit on as well, which is, okay, if the script doesn't run perfectly, can I run it again? So yeah, item potent, right? Thing, yeah. yeah, the whole unipotent thing is, honestly, it's a North Star for a lot of things that we want to do. But the truth is, it's fairly impossible to guarantee that if I run one thing once at this time, it will always work again, right? For Think about the cloud run case. Let's say someone were to change my IAM permissions on the service account I was using to actually push the cloud run. It wouldn't work maybe 10 minutes from now. So I think a lot of people, it's always a point in time, but I think just having that as our North Star and holding that bar as like where we want to get to makes us actually do defensive programming to make sure that we're actually cleaning up after ourselves and tracking the resources that we create. One thing I didn't show in the demo is when I'm creating things inside of Cloud Run, I'm leaving a label inside of the Cloud Run resource on GCP so that I can actually come back and find all the resources that I created previously. So that way I can run in more of a stateless mode. If I don't find a resource inside of Kubernetes, I know that I can go and clean up everything that I created without touching the things that I didn't create. Uh, very good. Very good. So you're actually storing the state as a part of the the the, res the target resource that you put in Cloud Run. Yeah. So this is why cloud providers, a lot of people will tell you for billing purposes, for automation and security, those labels become attributes that really help us with the end-to-end -end lifecycle management. It's, it's one of ownership. Who owns this resource? And sometimes that's hard to tell if you don't leave a breadcrumb trail to remind yourself that you put it there. So you mentioned imperative, and, and I wanted to go back to your notion of data. So you were talking a lot about now it's data. It's gone from being programming to, to, to being data. And the term that I'd like to use for that is actually programming via data. I'm a mm. functional programmer at heart. Um, and in languages like Scheme and Lisp, the, the programs are data. And so there's this really interesting notion there. Um, and I, you know, I don't know your background, whether you, you come I don't from know. a I actually I used to write a little Haskell back in the day. Haskell. And I remember I was just like you. I was like, I saw list comprehension for the first time. Uh, Haskell also has this concept of uh, grab three values from one to infinity. 
And since it's a functional programming language, it can handle that just fine. But it all fell apart when they started talking about monads. Because at some point, <laughs> you got to touch the network. And when you touch the network, all of that kind of starts to fall apart because it's like, well, there are side effects in the real world. And this is where we jump off. But you're right. When you can contain the side effects and get predictable outcomes, then the world can be defined in this very functional. And as you put it, incorporating data into that is a beautiful thing when you see it. Yeah, really fantastic. So, so I was uh, I was noodling on this idea the other day that I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, which is that that cloud native. I mean, we've been on this cloud native journey for some time, and cloud native patterns for software design, I argue, are a little bit ahead of these more what I would call cloud native patterns for operations. And I went back and I looked at an article from Martin Fowler. Turns out it was a while ago, 2014, which was the article where he said, you have to be this tall to ride the ride. You have to be this tall to be able to use microservices. And in my memory, it was all about, oh, the, the software architectural patterns. But I just went back to it and I realized that he was in fact not talking about the software architectural patterns. And there were companies like Netflix that really got great at doing that with things like Eureka and Hystrix and Ribbon and all of those things, which interestingly enough now are already seen a little bit as legacy. People are moving beyond those already. But Martin was talking in 2014, not about those software design patterns, but he was talking about things like rapid provisioning and basic monitoring because monitoring is so critical, critically important. He was more talking about it from the human perspective, but the reconciler, the reconciliation loops have to have data to be able to do things or rapid application development. And so as is usual with Martin Fowler, he's maybe sometimes a little bit ahead of the rest of us. He was already thinking about some of these operational concerns when he was talking even about the microservice patterns. Yeah, I think I also saw this back in the day, you know, early 2010. The application servers, I believe, did a lot of experimentation in this area, right? So the idea that, you know, this is back when people just had a handful of servers, unlike the distributed systems most people embark on today. But back then, I'll take JBoss, for example. It took a lot of operational things and just put it right there in the application server so you could just focus on building your application that would then get deployed or hot deployed. I remember we used to drop these war files in a particular directory and they would unpack it for you and replace the other one and ideally not drop any of the requests that were bound for your particular piece of code. And when I looked at that, a lot of the stuff that we were doing there, dynamic binding, there was clustering technology, uh, there was interfaces that you could actually swap out for storage and networking. And there was also a clean API to debug how the app, we were using these JMX, you know, m beans to get and poke and prod what the app was doing. And I think what we're doing now is we're expanding that at the infrastructure level. So it's no longer is it language specific. We're saying we can probably provide all of these facilities for any application by baking that same logic into something like Kubernetes and Prometheus and et cetera. Very cool. So what we're doing here then with GitOps, and, um, and actually I would love to have you come back because you said something um, at the very beginning of your talk, you said going from ops to GitOps. And just for our audience, if you could just re-summarize what you mean, what were the essential elements in going from ops to GitOps, then I have a follow-on question after you uh, after you described that. Yeah, so I think I'm just using my personal experience here. So when I started out in operations, the thing I first had to learn was, what is the thing I'm operating? If it's Linux, what are the commands I can run? How do I get information? Um, if I'm going to start an application back then, I had to learn init scripts. So this is before system D unit files. And you just learn all of these interfaces, right? And they all come together to hopefully deploy your application. And then we wrote scripts to automate that. I got to do if config for this part, uh, init script for this part, at git for this part. And then these become your interfaces, but they're so loosely coupled. They're not well defined. It's all over the map. But once you get a handle on the interfaces, the inputs and the outputs they produce, 
now you're on the foundational stage to say, okay, now I can actually automate this, right? You can't really automate a thing you don't understand or a thing you don't have a good process for. So now once you get that, I think that's the first step towards this GitOps. What Kubernetes has taught us is that we can put a data model in front of that. And I think that has been the, the missing link. We just started writing scripts and using bash interpreters to do this stuff imperatively and live. And it never gave us a way to back out, dry run. We never had a data model to do any of policy enforcement on. It's all about, can you run this script or not? And that's just too heavy handed for what we need to do. So I think the next phase is if you understand how to automate a thing because you understand the thing you're automating, now you have to define that data model. And if you can define that data model, now you have the foundation to create that reconciliation loop. And then we just adopt those developer workflows that we use for software development, branches, tags, code reviews. That's discipline that we use to drive our automation. And I think that's where you really start to get the benefits of this thing we call GitOps. Awesome. And I, I love that soundbite, which is you talked about the data model actually now giving you the surface area against which you can apply policies. It's impossible to apply policies to a series of steps that are non-deterministic. And how do you apply policy against that? You always have to have a surface area. Policies are applied to tenants or they're applied to controller, you know, a, a, a something that's happening out in, in the cloud run environment. You have to have that surface to apply policies to. And they give us a contract to promise to the people who use our platforms. When I run a bash script that says, do a thing, do a thing where? Do a thing with what? And, it's, and it just loses the transparency. But what we do now, and maybe command line flags help, but now we get to flip that around and say, here is the thing that you're allowed to ask for. And who cares if I change how I do it later, as long as I give you back what you asked for. And that contract is really powerful because these systems evolve over time. Yeah. Um, I like how you encapsulated all those things again, together with the data model, the delivery mechanism and the reconciler at the end. And what's starting to form in my head around that is this notion of, oh, when you, you had a word for it, when you were talking about puppet um, is these, oh, modules is, there were puppet modules and now we can start to envision, we can start to like get this vague feeling of maybe there's GitOps modules where all of those pieces are put together into a module that we can deliver that now gives you that modern operational experience. Yeah, a lot of Googlers are working on this. Um, if you think about it, we have a project called Kubernetes Config Connector and we have a bunch of reconcilers for all GCP resources along with their data model and when you install it, it almost feels like you're installing it as a module. KCC gives you all of this functionality. And then shout out to the Microsoft folks. Um, they've been thinking about this idea as well, even packaging applications as whole models. And if you think about it, some of those applications not only define the Kubernetes configurations, but also those reconcilers, interfaces, and even sidecars that go with it. So a lot of organizations, big and small, are doing lots of good work around this idea. And I think we might get to the point where people just start installing these packs, AKA operators, if you will. Yeah, very cool. One of the other projects coming out of Google that we've been um, poking around with and experimenting a little bit is when you start thinking about having this declarative configuration that's sitting in a repository somewhere, in the simple example that you showed, it's a single repository with a simple YAML. But when you start deploying very complex systems, you're going to have things in multiple repositories and you're going to need to do some type of, and you're also potentially going to have fleets of deployments. And so are the deployments exactly the same across the fleet? Where are there the, the differences and so on? So one of the projects that we've been playing with is KPT, which allows you to essentially have, if you will, a hierarchy and inheritance from Git repository to the next Git repository with provenance in place so that you can actually start programming against that inheritance hierarchy. Yeah, that's a lot of Googlers. And you know, I work with a guy named Brian Grant at Google and the project is called Kept. And it's like a play on words for apt, you know, app Git, Kept Git. And that's getting closer to this packaging of these things. Cause you're right, sometimes we need to assemble a package of resources from other places, right? Because that's a little bit separate on how we manage those things. And then once you have that package, of course you may check it in somewhere else. And these tools may be able to pull from those packages 
versus raw Git repository. Think about software development. We don't pull raw software from version control. Uh, that's not normally what not you do. Not usually. Normally I always look for the binary. I don't build from yeah. source. <laughs> yeah, you want a binary or a package or in, in, yeah. in the nature where we're talking is a container. So I think GitOps is cool, but maybe we have to look at what we learned from the software industry that pulling directly from Git may or may not uh, be the right thing. Because think about if I want to share something with someone, I may not want to give them access to my Git repository. I may want to give them a subset or the built compiled version of my repository. So I think that's just going to be area for, you know, thinking and improvement. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so I do have to, uh, so one, one last question and then a final comment at the end, and I'll give you a chance to close it out. Um, so I, I've used the term cloud native operations several times and with your background in operations and you've seen this transformation, um, we talked about this pattern today, this GitOps pattern, which really lends itself, really brings a lot to cloud native operations. Any other patterns off the top of your head that you say, oh, these are essential patterns that we need to realize kind of this next generation of cloud native operations? I mean, there's so many good patterns, to be honest, where either you're talking about sampling data for metrics or tracing. That's a big pattern. Everyone in their brain thinks they're going to take all of the data that they get from their logs and all of the data that they get for tracing and store it somewhere until they figure out that they have petabytes of noise, right? So there's patterns to think about how do you filter through that. But honestly, there's, there's a different pattern I hope people pick up in this space. You need to learn how to make a decision, write that decision out until you get to a point where that decision is no longer working and then make another decision and go from there. There's a pattern there. Like you just gotta make a decision. And a lot of people in this cloud native space right now are paralyzed. There's so many tools coming out. There's so many patterns people are sharing. Cause there isn't one pattern for all of these things, right? The idea of Zipkin and passing around an HTTP header for tracing data is only one pattern for tracing things. There might be other patterns, but what you gotta do is at some point you gotta make a decision that, hey, I want to adopt something like Weave Flux. I'm going to learn it and be patient with learning it and make sure that I can get all of the value that thing has to offer before I start going to hunt for something else. And that's the part we haven't mastered because most people that are really good at this, a lot of the projects you talked about, Netflix and Eureka and some of the tools they shared, they made a decision to do something and then they worked on it and they were able to share the results of that decision. Imagine just hunting for the right tool week after week, month after month. You got to learn how to make some decisions. And I think that will help uh, with any other pattern you decide to adopt because you know how to evaluate it and then let it go when it's no longer necessary. That is great advice. So the last thing that I'll say um, before I give you a chance to, you know, give us some, some parting wisdom is that I will point out um, that it wasn't lost on me that we got a dope thing from you, which is when you said that the, the dope thing about this is that you can have Flux running in a hundred different clusters. They can all be pointing to the same repository and you can get that repeatable deployment. So when you get a dope from Kelsey during a, during a, a tech, tech uh, session that's a pretty that's a pretty good day so awesome. thank you oh, for that glad to hear it yeah my parting words are if you're a system administrator and you're looking at this GitOps and you're a little bit intimidated i think you should find comfort that you probably know 90 percent of what you need to know to approach this problem start with some of the tools go through the examples but i want you to pause for a second and look at what you already know and see how it applies because I bet you, and I hopefully I was able to demonstrate today, that the fundamentals are almost exactly the same as you were doing before. It's about how we captured those fundamentals, encapsulate them, let the tools do the heavy lifting for us. That's what's new. So it's about leveraging your existing skill set. Don't forget the fundamentals, and you'll always be able to safely evaluate this stuff. And yeah, there'll be a learning curve, but don't believe that the fundamentals are what you're learning. You're just learning the particular take on the fundamentals. That's great. 
Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so delighted to have you here and we look forward to uh, having more in the future. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.